Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, this is going to be the first of two, two parts of lectures on Chapter 45 in your Egan's um, 12th edition. This material is going to cover respiratory failure and the need for ventilatory support. So I kind of felt like this was a good chapter to start us off in life support because <clears throat> in this course, you're going to be learning a lot about mechanical ventilation and um, I think this chapter really covers and helps you understand what are indicators of the need for mechanical ventilation. It also goes back and does a really, really nice reminder and refresher on a lot of the things that we learned in CP Phys. So um, if you hated cardiopulmonary physiology last spring, um, this is kind of the crash refresher course. Um, we're going to go over a lot of material that we talked about then, um, even some of the same calculations. So um, that'll be kind of exciting and fun to bring that stuff back forward. Uh, make sure we didn't forget everything over the summer. So let's <clears throat> uh, move forward in these slides here. Oops, sorry. Mouse is not wanting to work with me today. All right. So there's some learning objectives that's going to be covered in this um, chapter for you. Most of it's just going to be about um, defining what ventilatory failure is and then differentiating between um, behind a lot of the different causes. So simplify those objectives. That's really what our goal is here. Um, we're going to be discussing those indications for ventilatory support and discussing some indications for non-invasive ventilation. And that's all going to take part in the next lecture, part two. All right. So um, ventilatory failure is an important thing for us to discuss because beyond the medications and the basic therapeutics that you guys learned about in your first year, um, mechanical ventilators are probably the most important piece of equipment that we're associated with in the hospital. So respiratory therapy has become such an important profession because of the advances that have happened in mechanical ventilation over the years. Um, I think a lot of times nurses, when vet mechanical ventilation first started out, you know, when it was just a couple simple knobs and buttons, they're like, we can manage this. Um, but as technology has progressed, it really highlights the importance for having a specialty that focuses just on kind of the mechanicals and principles behind ventilation, which I think is pretty fascinating fascinating again because I really love anatomy and physiology and I really love physics. Um, I feel like the mechanical ventilation is a blend of all of those things together. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we're really responsible for these, um, the interactions between the patient and these machines in the hospital. Um, and studies have shown that we have not only reduced mortality rates um, down to 32% with ventilatory failure, which is significant. Um, it used to be in the upper 40s. Um, it's mentioned in your Egan's book <clears throat> or low 40s. So it was a significant reduction. But there's other studies out there that show that respiratory therapists and respiratory therapy driven protocols are proven to reduce things like ventilator days, which reduce overall length of stay for our patients, which is hugely impactful for <clears throat> reimbursement and, you know, those quality metrics for um, how well hospitals get paid and the money that they make and revenue that they generate. So we have a big, big role in that. So um, ventilatory failure, the definition is really the inability to maintain either normal delivery of O2 to the tissue or the normal removal of CO2 from the tissue. So remember, we learned in CP Phys, oxygen comes in through the lungs gets diffused into the blood, and then gets pumped out to the tissues. That blood picks up, drops off the oxygen, picks up the CO2s that are, that's produced as a waste product from metabolism. That CO2 is transported back to the heart and lungs and is dropped off in the lungs to be exhaled while the, that blood picks up new oxygen, okay? So, Typically, when we're talking about ventilatory failure, that can either happen because either there's an increased respiratory workload, meaning that the tissues are needing more oxygen, or they're producing more carbon dioxide than the lungs can handle. 
Okay. So certain metabolic processes are going to cause more CO2 production at the, the tissue levels. Um, and more oxygen consumption, and that's gonna increase our respiratory workload. Um, <clears throat> respiratory, uh, certain diseases also are gonna potentially cause respiratory failure by decreasing either your ventilatory strength or your ventilatory endurance. Um, I think an important thing to note and to remind you guys of is that your body is never going to be, put itself in a situation where it's gonna be energy negative. So at a certain point, the body's going to go, it costs us too much energy to breathe effectively. So that is when you start seeing those acid-base imbalances where CO2 is getting produced, but it's costing the body too much energy to get rid of that CO2 through ventilation. And then the body just goes, well, we, we can't, we can't be energy deficient or energy in an energy deficit just by breathing well. So we're going to slow down our breathing in order to conserve energy. And then you start seeing those ri that rise in the CO2 and the blood. Okay. So that's just a normal physiologic function of our bodies to try to help balance everything out, which we learned again about in CB phys as homeostasis. Okay. <clears throat> so d certain criteria that's just right off the bat that we're going to talk about is um, anytime you have a PaO2 less than 60 and or a CO2 greater than 50, that individual is considered in ventilatory failure. Okay, so those are very, very, very simple, clear cut definitions of this. So when you look at an ABG for a patient and you see either of those two things, you can say that that patient is in ventilatory failure and potentially needs some form of ventilatory support, okay? It's also important to understand that there's acute ventilatory failure and chronic ventilatory failure, okay? So that acute process would be your patients that maybe had drug overdosed. So, I, t um, I take a way too many um, sleeping pills or way too many of my sedatives <clears throat> and I kind of can have a respiratory depression from a drug overdose. I'm going to go into ventilatory failure because my central nervous system is not going to be signaling my lungs to breathe adequately. So that is an acute process that is going to cause my CO2 to increase. Um, depending if I'm breathing shallow, I might have a lower, my PaO2 might also decrease, and that would be an indication for some sort of respiratory support and respiratory, ventilatory failure. There's also a chronic process. This happens over a longer period of time. So acute means in the moment and chronic means over a longer period of time. That chronic process usually has to do with some sort of chronic lung issue or neuromuscular disease. So uh, chronic lung issues, big one right off the bat is gonna be your COPD. These are those patients that have those very super special ABGs um, that we looked at in CP Phys, the ones that show that chronic ventilatory failure where the pH has normalized because the body's renal system has, has had time to compensate for the chronic elevation of that CO2. Okay, so with that being said, ABG analysis is super helpful with diagnosing this, okay? Um, so looking at the first part, just looking at the PaO2 levels and talking about hypoxic, hypoxemic ventilatory failure, okay? So hypoxemic ventilatory failure, this is where... Um, you're not getting much enough oxygen into your blood. <clears throat> so this can be caused by things, common causes are that VQ mismatch, which is the most common, ventilation perfusion mismatch, shunting, alveolar hyperventilation, diffusion impairment. So diffusion, again, is that term that we use for how well the gases move from one system to the other. So if the gases are in my alveoli, how well they diffuse across that AC membrane into the blood or vice versa, you know, your CO2 in your blood diffusing across that AC membrane into the alveoli. Um, <clears throat> perfusion diffusion impairments, that's very, that's kind of a very um, diagnosis specific um, 
disorder, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth, um, just decreased inspired oxygen, which is very uncommon, and then venous admixture. So um, we're going to kind of just get through all of these a little bit more in depth in this first part of the lecture. <clears throat> So looking at a closer look at ventilation perfusion mismatch. So ventilation perfusion mismatch is <clears throat> where there is more air than blood or more blood than air. Can, can happen either way. So, um, so this balance um, is normal in different regions of the lungs or this imbalance. So in the apices of the lungs, if you're sitting upright, you know that you're going to have better ventilation because air, gravity, air is going to be more likely to rise to the top parts of your lungs, fill up the top parts of your lungs better, and then be less likely to be in the, in the bases of your lungs, but, and vice versa for your blood, right? Blood is more dense, so gravity is going to make it more blood or more perfusion at the bases, less perfusion at the apices. Okay, so that's just normal. Everybody has that. Okay, so pathological mismatches occur when diseases disrupt this imbalance. So the most common we see is when ventilation is compromised, meaning that we have a lower ventilation to normal um, perfusion. Okay. So this is usually what we see in our COPD patients, where ventilation get, becomes decreased by things like um, uh, bronchoconstriction, which increases my airway resistance. Okay, so VQ mismatch. So I'm going to, I just kind of put an extra slide in here to kind of visually show this. Um, so in a normal lung, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see V and and Q are going to be equal in all kind of all parts of the lungs. Oops. Oh, I must have messed this up. I'm going to pop these all in at once because I, oops, I must have messed that up. Sorry. All right. So we'll just use our penny. All right. So let's say we have two parts um, or if, if my lung ventilation perfusion is going to be normal, that means V is going to equal one over here. There's one V to one P. Okay, so that equals, they equal each other. And over in this lung, I've got one V to one P. Again, it's equal, okay, to each other. We're just looking at side by side, left lung versus right lung, not tops versus bottom to make things simpler. Okay, so in an abnormal lung, what happens, like um, especially with ventilation issues, let's say we have an issue with ventilation in this, this lung over here, this left lung over here. Okay, so I'm only getting half the ventilation into this left lung that I normally would. Okay, so that could be an issue with my airway resistance or an issue with compliance. Either one is going to make that lung harder to ventilate and I'm only going to get half as much volume into that lung. Okay, but I'm still perfusing well. My perfusion is still um, normal. Over here then, the rest of that ventilation has to go somewhere. So this, this lung gets you know, one and one half of ventilation. So this ventilation exceeds what, um, what it normally does and my perfusion stays the same. So overall, even if I add everything up, this is still 2V and 2P for the entire, entire both lungs. Over here, I still have 2V and 2P for both lungs for both lungs here. Um, so this is just trying to help you demonstrate that ventilation, overall ventilation and perfusion can look the same if I take the total numbers, but different areas of the lungs can be affected differently by this, this mismatch, and that is going to overall compromise your oxygenation. Okay, so then I've got another slide to talk about that. Oops, why? Okay. Okay, so if you're taking that mismatched lung here, okay, and you're looking at this mismatched lung, what's happening over here in this lung is because my ventilation is lower, 
And this guy, if anybody remembers who this guy is, everybody's favorite, or at least my favorite, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay. So over here, with this good ventilation, normal ventilation would, would give me about this, right? This is where my oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve would end up if my lung was ventilating normally, okay? <clears throat> but this guy over here, because I'm only getting half of what I had before, I'm only getting about this much ventilation and then this much PaO2. So you see the PaO2 in this lung drops down, because I'm only getting half, drops down to 26.8. So that is much less than the, uh, than the 80, 26.8. That's much less than the 80 that you see in like what would you would expect in a normal lung. Okay, over here where the ventilation improves, if you think about it, if I improve ventilation here, even if I improve ventilation here, I'm not going to see a huge increase in saturation, okay? So even if I improve ventilation, my saturation isn't going to increase that much on my patient, all right? So in the end, my patients, which is the more important part, right? Oxygen saturation, we learned that is way more important for O2 transportation than PaO2. So we see that even by having one lung ventilating better, that lung that isn't ventilating well enough is going to have a much bigger impact on my overall oxygenation for my patient. So let's say this patient, this lung, the blood's coming out of this lung with a PaO2 of 26 and a saturation of 50%. And this lung's coming out with a PaO2 of 120 and a saturation of 100%. That's still not going to give you as well good of oxygenation or oxygen transport as if both lungs were giving you, you know, normal, which is like 96%. Okay. And we could do the math out by those totally carrying capacity. Um, calculations that I made you guys do um, last semester, or you can just trust me that the math is going to come out a lot worse for this patient than the patient that had the normal uh, VQ matching in both lungs. <clears throat> So that VQ mismatch is going to result in the patient having a lower PaO2, lower SaO2, and they're going to present with things like dyspnea um, because they're going to have that sensation of the difficulty breathing because of the low PaO2. They're going to be tachycardic and tachypnic because of those low PaO2 levels. Remember those um, chemoreceptors are going to ca cause the patient to want to breathe deeper and faster and have a faster rest heart rate. They're also going to have, um, could potentially have that accessory muscle use. That's usually kind of an important sign of that ventilatory failure, um, nasal flaring. Um, they could have um, ketal edema, um, and that's usually always going to result be the result of some cardiac in origin. So if they have presence of pedal edema, it usually means that their heart's not working very well. And that's what's causing the mismatch. Um, they can also have some cyanosis. Remember, cyanosis is a really hard thing for people to always differentiate. Um, but it's that bluish discoloration of the mucous membranes that indicates hypoxia. Um, and then if the patient is severely hypoxemic, they're going to have some confusion or some change in their um, mental status. That's uh, usually a big red flag with um, high presence of hypoxemia. Um, and they might have some central nervous system dysfunction. So when you listen to these patients, typically their lung sounds are going to be relative to what's causing the ventilation issue in the first place. So they could have bronchospasms um, or the bilateral wheezing from bronchospasms or fluids in the airway and pulmonary edema, upper airway diseases like um, croup or 
um, uh, hypoglottitis. Um, their breath sounds could sound diminished. Um, that's very common in patients with emphysema um, because of the hyperinflation that's um, found in emphysema patients. Uh, they can also have unilateral abnormalities, which means that the abnormality is only heard on one side or one portion of the lungs. So one lung might um, sound way wheezier than the other lung. Um, there might be an absence of breath sounds in one lung due to like um, atelectasis or collapse or um, some sort of um, consolidation, like an effusion or a pneumonia. You could have those crackles from alveolar filling, um, like those opening and closing of those alveoli with that's found as a symptom of atelectasis. So radiology, radio, radiologic findings, okay? I put slides in because I can't tell you how many students say, groan to me about how many radi chest radiographs they get on board exams. And they're like, oh, I, didn't want, I didn't think they'd make me look at so many of those. So just start looking at chest x-rays. I've said it probably for the last two classes. Um, the more chest x-rays you look at, the more comfortable you get with looking at these, the easier your life is going to be moving forward. There is nothing wrong with not pulling up the chest radiology report, but actually looking at the x-ray when you're looking and rounding with your patients. This is a very good practice for you guys to get into as respiratory therapists. Um, so on the left here, I am showing one of the radiologic findings that you can have with ventilation um, mismatch which is the white out lung. So this is where your lungs are completely whited out. Um, this is usually evidence of that partial or total alveolar filling, either from pulmonary edema, pneumonia. Um, it's also very characteristic of patients with what we call restrictive lung diseases or lung diseases. This is another key thing that I want you to start like cementing in your head, restrictive lung diseases affect the lungs compliance. So it makes the lungs stiffer and it's going to reduce the volume, the total volume that you can get into your lungs. So restrictive decreases your compliance, decreases your lung volume. Obstructive diseases, on the other hand, this is a picture of a black chest radi radiograph or um, a um, uh, like blanking on the word right now, um, radiolucent or translucent or any, those types of terms are commonly used when you um, see a lot of dark areas on the chest radiograph indicating areas of low density or air. Okay, so this happens when the lungs are hyperinflated. So this is a common characteristic of obstructive lung diseases. So obstructive lung diseases affect air are affected by airway resistance. Airway resistance increases in obstructive lung diseases, meaning that the lungs, the tubes that we breathe through, become narrower, tighter, so it makes it harder for that air to pass through. That's airway resistance. Airway resistance, remember, is going to be higher during exhalation than during inspiration. So during inspiration, those tubes are going to be the, pulled open through those inner th thoracic pressures, making that tube as wide as it's going to be. Air is going to flow in. Then when we try to exhale, those tubes narrow, making it harder for the air to flow back out. So that's increased airway resistance common in obstructive lung diseases, and that affects not volume, but your flow rate, okay? This, I'm gonna probably say this 50,000 more times before you graduate, but that is such an important thing for you to understand. So this type of chest X-ray is demonstrating that hyperinflation, where air is getting trapped in the lungs because that air resistance during exhalation is too high and the air cannot get out properly, cannot flow out properly. So air is getting trapped in these lungs, they're hyperinflated, and you can see that by how flat the diaphragm looks down here. 
down here, this diaphragm is very, very, very flat. The other thing you should do, start doing is start counting the posterior ribs. So the posterior ribs are the ones that curve upward like this. Those are the posterior ribs on your chest x-ray. Okay, so if I count those, I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, so typically most adults are going to be around ninth and ninth to tenth intercostal. So having that um, down to the eleventh, that's showing that hyperinflation. Okay, moving on to shunts. So kind of an extreme version of EQ mismatch is where there's no ventilation to match the perfusion. So typically we have an anatomic shunt. We learned about this, okay? Anatomic shunts are those normal, that's like your thespian vessels, those normal like just little um, anatomical um, pathways in our heart, between our heart and lungs that um, kind of mix that unoxygenated blood with the oxygenated blood in the cardiac output. So the normal anatomic ones are very, very minor. It's like less about two to three percent of the total cardiac output. So very, very insignificant. But anything over 10 percent of uh, anything, you have to calculate this, anything over 10 percent is considered mild shunt, 20% becomes significant. And if you have over a 30% shunt, that is very, very critical. Your patient's very critical. Um, so <clears throat> pulmonary shunts occur when there's no ventilation to match the perfusion. So this is always, always, always some sort of pathological thing in nature. So um, leads to that hypoxemia because those alveoli collapse um, or fill with fluid or extudate, um, which you see in like... Um, atelectasis, pulmonary edema, pneumonia patients. So this is kind of a nice picture to show you how shunts, what kind of shunts are. Um, I, most people like talk about shunts um, with dead space. So in a shunt here, you're seeing this poorly ventilated alveoli. So this alveoli has no O2 in it and blood is going past it. So all of this blood that's going past this poorly ventilated alveoli is not going to be oxygenated at all. So unoxygenated blood is then going to mix with this ox oxygenated blood that's going past an open alveoli, and that's going to autom um, result in overall decreased oxygenation. Okay, so imagine this alveoli being a bunch of alveoli together in like the left lower lobe of your lung because of a pneumonia. That whole left lower lobe is gonna get perfused with blood that's not gonna get oxygenated. And it's all gonna get dumped back into the, um, to the left atrium of the heart. It's all gonna get mixed together and it's gonna get pumped out with the oxygenated blood, unoxygenated blood, and it's reducing the amount of oxygen that's in the blood overall. Okay, physiologic dead space on the other hand is where you have like no blood flow. Um, a lot of times people talk, call this dead space where I have oxygen going in to my alveoli. So I have oxygen going in here, having oxygen going in here. I've got blood flow going to some of them, but no blood flow going to other oxygenated areas. So this is usually related to like perfusion issues like a PE. So let's say if there's like a pulmonary embolism or clot somewhere in this vessel, that is making it so that no oxygen can come in, no blood can come in contact with this oxygen here. So one of the major differences between just a regular VQ mismatch and a shunt is that VQ mismatches are going to respond to oxygen therapy, but shunts are not. And why that is, is because I can't, if I, even if I put more oxygen over here, there's only so much that can get picked up by the blood. It's not going to make up for the fact that no oxygen got in over here. Okay. Versus in like, a VQ mismatch or dense space ventilation, if I have more oxygen going in here, this blood is going to go get rerouted and I'm going to be able to have the ability to at least pick up some more oxygen. 
Okay, so this is the classic shunt equation that we learned about in CP Phys. I included this in the slide deck because you are going to need it for your worksheet, okay? So that's CCO2 is that um, the carrying capacity of O2 from your pulmonary capillaries. CaO2 is a carrying capacity of oxygen in your arteries. CVO2 is a carrying capacity for oxygen in your veins, okay? I gave you a, um, a patient on your worksheet and I asked you to calculate the shunt out for that patient. So um, you are going to use this equation to calculate that out. We did this in CP Phys. Again, this is just a refresher. Use your calculations book to help you with the worksheet. Remember, your calculations book has all of the calculations for each piece of this if you need help, okay? And step-by-step -step instructions. So again, use your resources and go back into that calculations book to get um, fill in the information here, okay? <clears throat> so shunts present very similar to VQ mismatch. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times they could have, you know, the sounds of those bilateral or unilateral crackles. Um, that's common because crackles, again, indicate that opening and closing of those alveoli, with, which is seen with atelectasis or, you know, fluid-filled alveoli. You have um, absence of breath sounds if you have, if those areas are completely collapsed or there's a mass or effusion there. You're going to see that white chest x-ray with shunt patients. Um, anatomical shunts. Those don't really show up on chest x-rays. Um, those are going to appear normal. Um, uh, but those get usually diagnosed by having the patient breathe 100% O2. And they look at the patients um, like they do an echocardiogram with the patient and look at the, kind of the blood flows and the oxygen levels. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so diffusion impairments, these, when we're talking about diffusion impairments, these are kind of the movement of gas across those membranes. Okay, so on this this picture here on the, the left side again, this is normal. Um, we have this very thin um, interstitial space in between our alveoli and our capillary. Okay, so that, again, remember Fick's equation that talks about diffusion. So it's the thickness of this space that's going to affect diffusion. The thicker it becomes, this is normal. As it becomes thicker, my diffusion decreases. Um, so diseases that thicken that um, AC space or that interstitium um, are your fibrotic diseases like fib uh, pulmonary fibrosis, asbestosis, sarcoidosis, um, any of those interstitial lung diseases that you're going to learn about in Jim's classes, those are going to cause that um, AC membrane to thicken and make it harder for the oxygen that's in here to get into here. Um, so uh, we can also see these alveoli become destroyed. Um, so if my surface area is reduced, that's another part of fixed equation. If my surface area decreases, diffusion decreases. So surface area and emphysema gets destro destroyed. Um, and then that makes it harder to oxygenate. And then you can have some pulmonary vascular abnormalities um, like anemia. So if I don't have enough hemoglobin down in this blood vessel, it's not going to, the oxygen is not going to be able to diffuse this cross as well. Um, if I have pulmonary emboli, um, where there's a clot in here, that is going to cause issues with diffusion or hypertension. So if this blood vessel is, um, is really constricted, that is going to reduce the blood flow through here. So if the blood flow is reduced, I'm not going to be able to, again, diffuse as much oxygen across. Okay, so typically clinically presenting with this disease, patients usually have a dry cough. They've got a lot of fi fine bibasular crackles, which is a commonly seen in pulmonary fibrosis. Um, patients with pulmonary hypertension usually show a lot of jugular vein distension. And if you think about it, remember JVD, jugular vein distension, happens because you cannot, the blood 
that goes up into the head, that gets pumped up into the head <laughs> through the carotid arteries, then as it's trying to return to the right side of the heart, there's the um, there's so much pr it's, there's so much pressure in the lungs on those vessels and that vasculature that's causing that right-sided heart pressure to increase, making it hard for the venous return to happen, which causes a JVD. So again, I feel like I have to draw this out for somebody probably. Um, just grab a line. Okay, so remember, if this is my head, okay, and this is my heart down here, Okay, I've got carotid arteries that are bringing the blood up into my head, and then my carotid, my jugular veins are supposed to be bringing it back down to the heart. Okay, my lungs. Let's say, if my lungs, oh, stop it. If my lungs have increased pressure from pulmonary hypertension that causes anything behind my lungs which is the right side of my heart to also have increased pressure so if the right side of my heart is increased pressure that is going to make it hard that's going to put increased pressure in this jugular vein here and that blood is not going to be able to flow down into the right side of heart, the heart as well okay so that jugular vein then ju is going to start looking descended this is all that hemodynamic stuff again that we learned back in cp phys but it's been a long summer <laughs> so remember that picture of the heart split in half and anything that happens downstream is going to cause back pressure so the lungs are downstream of the right side of the heart if I have pulmonary hypertension, that increases the pressures on that right side of the heart. And then that increases the pressures on any type of venous return. So if any blood that's trying to come back to that right side of the heart is going to have a harder time coming back because it's trying to pump against an increased afterload. So my, my patients, that's why patients tend to have um, JVD with um, pulmonary hypertension or congestive heart failure or COPD, they also have like pedal edema for the same reason because the blood that's trying to come back from the periphery is having trouble because of that increased right sided heart pressure. All right. So this is that perfusion diffusion impairment. Don't get hung up on this. This is the hepto, heptopulmonary syndrome that happens. Um, it's kind of classified with shortness of breath and hypoxemia. It's caused by vasodilation. So if you see in this normal lung here, my capillary is like eight to 15 micro units. But in this heptopulmonary syndrome, which happens when you have patients with liver disease, um, they, this, pulmonary capillary dilates, okay? So that blood vessel gets broadened um, and this actually causes dyspnea because the patient, even, even though you've got that more blood going through there, it's hard, harder for this oxygen to get into the, to get all the way into the middle and attached to the hemoglobin kind of in the middle of this vessel, okay? Um, so it's having trouble working its way all the way into the middle and saturating the middle part of this blood vessel and the results in hypoxemia. So this is worse for patients in the upright position, okay? So, um, um, so they, um, and that has everything to do again with, um perfusion being worse when you're sitting upright than when you're laying down or laying flat so these patients are probably the only types of patients that are going to experience that platypnea where they're more dyspneic sitting upright than laying flat all right and another very uncommon one is your decreased inspired oxygen. Um, you're not going to encounter these patients here in Wisconsin as flatlanders, um, but this happens in high altitude. So your high altitude mountain climbing patients, um, 
This also is something to think about, though, with your patients, that these are always questions on the MBRC exam, is when you're sending a patient on an airplane. So airplanes are pre pressurized, but they're not pressurized all the way, at one, way to one atmosphere. So um, patients with... Um, you know, pulmonary disease, they may require supplemental oxygen when they're on the airplane. Um, and your book talks about different tests. So if you work in a fancy pulmonary function lab, you might be performing these tests where you're using, purposely using um, a inspired O2 less than 21% to mimic what happens in these high altitude situations. Um, and that just helps you prepare and the doctor prepare for um, sending a patient if the patient's going on, an, on a flight and making sure they have enough oxygen with them. Um, so typically with these types of patients, um, you're gonna you know treat the hypoxemia when it's present. Um, and, you know, kind of treat the cause if it's related to high altitude. Um, the, uh, another thing just to note also is, this, like, especially if you end up at Children's, there are some times that we use, um, uh, you know, less than inspired O2 therapeutically um, for certain congenital heart defects. So especially those hypoplastic left heart patients um, that you'll see sometimes at Children's Hospital. Those patients sometimes do get treated with a special gas mixture of less than 21% O2 um, to try to kind of uh, prevent pulmonary dilation and pulmonary blood flow. So th that we do that on purpose. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so venous bad mixture, this is a decrease in mixed venous O2. Um, and this is um, clinically what this kind of is, is when a patient's lung must add more oxygen to the blood because the blood that's coming in or coming back is even less, is already low. Um, so this, if this happens and the patient already has pulmonary disease, this can be a serious kind of excessively complicate the situation. So the most common cause of venous admixture is going to be heart disease or heart failure. Um, <clears throat> um, and that's because like as your cardiac output decreases, the tissues are going to take more of the oxygen than what they're used to taking out. Um, and then um, your patients are going to have a harder time making up the difference in their lungs with oxygen. So these two schematics, I feel like, help make this a little bit more understandable. So, okay, think about this as A, the ideal engine. My mixed venous blood comes back to my heart and lungs. It comes in contact with inspired O2, exhaled CO2, I should say CO2, and my fully oxygenated blood comes out of that, goes out to the tissues. Tissues use some of it, and then it comes back with this mixed venous blood, okay? So there's... Just think about it this way. There's this blood that's coming back to the heart and lungs is never 0% oxygen. There's always some oxygen that's coming back, okay? In um, a patient that has this venous admixture dysfunction, like with congestive heart failure, what happens is that the heart and the heart here isn't pumping out a full load of oxygenated blood because it's the left ventricle isn't pumping properly. So that left ventricle is not pumping out all of the oxygenated to the body, blood to the body. What gets pumped out goes through the body. The tissue picks up as much oxygen as it can from it. And then when it comes back, this venous mixture is going to be less than, is going to be even more decreased than this blood over here. So my PaO2 here coming into this, or this would be PVO2, is going to be lower than the PVO2 over here. Okay, this PVO2 is going to be higher. 
Okay, so this is going to be less than this PVO2 over here. Okay, so it's already coming into the system deficient. My heart and lungs are going to do the best they can, but because I'm coming in low, I'm not going to be able to make up the difference and the it's going to come out not as oxygenated as this as if the the blood would be if the system was working properly. And then this kind of is a perpetual problem because this reduced oxygenated blood is going to go out to the system. The tissues are going to take what they want. They don't care that the heart and lungs are struggling. They're going to take what they want and they need. And then it's going to come back reduced. And the heart and lungs are going to keep trying and trying their best to try to make up the difference. And they're not going to be able to do so without our assistance. Okay. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, moving on to the next slide here. This just kind of shows it again is you've got, this has how venous admixture can happen from ventilation as well. So you've got your cardiac output going into the car, uh, pulmonary vein, you've got the healthy alveoli, the collapsed alveoli. This one's going to get O2 over here. This one's not going to bring O2 over here. And then my pulmonary vein is going to have a reduced O2 because of, so this is going to be This is O2 is less than what it should be because of this guy over here. Okay, so that's another way this kind of could happen. Okay. So now we can get into kind of, we've done the definitions now we get into kind of the fun of figuring out how to differentiate between these things happening because if you look back at those clinical symptoms you see that they're not that different and you can be scratching your head at the bedside and go well I don't know if I'm hypoxemic because of a shunt because of a you know low ventilation or because of venous admixture from congestive heart failure how do I know um and this is where some of those awful calculations and some of the math can kind of help us. And this is one way I will say that we as therapists can really stand out at the bedside in that critical care space because no nurse is going to do this. They have no idea what this even means, most of them. You know, and the doctors probably don't even you don't think to use this very often. But some of these tools like your AA gradient and your PF ratio are extremely helpful and not that hard of calculations to make at the bedside to determine kind of the source of the hypoxemia. Because when you figure out what's causing the hypoxemia, then you know how to treat it. Okay. So going back again to last semester, we're going to talk about your AA gradient. So just a refresher, your key big A is the amount or the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, okay? That you have to calculate. So this is a P big A O2 is a calculation. The P little a is the amount of oxygen or the, the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. So it's whatever was in the alveoli that actually made it into the arterial blood got pumped out of the left side of the heart to the to the tissues and we we drew it out and measured it in a radial arterial blood gas okay this gradient kind of represents any def defects that are happening with ventilation and perfusion okay so it can be very helpful in determining whether it's a shunt if it's a um hypoventilation a shunt or vq mismatch Okay, so this is again a little refresher about what the calculation is for that partial pressure of oxygen in the av of alveolar oxygen. Okay, so it's pig, P big AO2, P PB is your barometric pressure. So if they say, if you ever get a question where it's at sea level, barometric pressure at sea level is 760, okay? So 760 is your barometric pressure at sea level. If they give you a barometric pressure, use the barometric pressure you're given. Your partial, pr your 
you then need to subtract the partial pressure of water. Okay, so this is the partial pressure of water, partial pressure of water in your lungs, which is at 37 degrees Celsius, 100% relative humidity. This number will always be 47, given 37 degrees Celsius, 100% relative humidity. That is the partial pressure of water there. So you need to get rid of the partial pressure of water, multiply that this number, which ends up being 713, by the FiO2. So the FiO2, you're going to multiply it by point something or other. So let's say the FiO2 is 50, so like 0.5. So 50% FiO2 translates to 0.5. Okay, so parentheses first, then you multiply by the FiO2. Then you subtract your PaCO2 times the coefficient. Your book says PaCO2 divided by 0.8. I always use the calculation CO2 times 1.25 comes out to the same exact number. I just like to multiply instead of divide, and that's just a me thing. <laughs> but if you're like me and like to multiply instead of divide, multiply by 1.25, it is totally fine to divide by 0.8. Instead, you will get the same thing. Okay, so that calculates out your PaO2, P big AO2. Then all you have to do is subtract your P little AO2, which is the number you got from your ABG. So typically, this is going to, oops, sorry, this is going to give you a value of around 10, okay? So typically, normally, it should be around 10, the difference between these two, okay? But also know that this number increases with age, okay? Your book talks about a way to estimate the mean alveolar to arterial difference by age, and that is taking the age of the patient dividing it by four, and then adding four. So let's say I am 40 years old, okay? I'm 40 years old, I'm gonna divide by four, so 10. Um, so my age divided by four is 10, plus four, that gives me 14. So my AA gradient, instead of being normally at 10, would be 14. Okay. So like I said, this just helps us with that differentiation of the cause of hypoxemia. Um, in patients with hypoventilation, if, the, if they're hypoxemic and the cause of the hypoventilation, the cause of the hypo, bleh, cause of the hypoxemia is hypoventilation, then our AA gradient will be normal. So anywhere with that 10 to 25 range, they're going to say is normal. Okay. If it's, 40 or 30, then it's high, and it's not because of hypoventilation, it's probably because of VQ mismatch or shunting, okay? So if your PA gradient is high, you're not thinking it's hypoventilation, you're thinking it's VQ mismatch or a shunt. If the patient responds to oxygen, you know that it is VQ mismatch. If there is little to no response to O2, then you know it's a shunt. And shunts needed to be treated differently. Shunts, remember, are those called completely collapsed alveoli and that um, uh, we need to do things to open up those collapsed alveoli or clear any fluid that's building up in our lungs that are making it hard for oxygen to get in. Alrighty, so... That is the beginning of our um, two-part lecture series. Come back for part two, where we're going to be talking about that hypercapnic part of respiratory failure. So instead of oxygen, we're going to look at CO2 as the culprit.